Hi everyone, I'm Amy LeMay and welcome to the Big Workplace Meeting. Um, today is day two of Heart Unions Week and this is our chance to celebrate the amazing work that unions do in the workplace and in communities across the UK. So I'm here with Frances O'Grady, General Secretary of the TUC and the first ever woman to hold that post. Hi Frances. Hello Amy. <laughs> Now, we are broadcasting live um, at heartunions.org, and I'd like to give a special shout out to some people out there. Uh, firstly, there's a big crew taking part from the GMB at the National Grid in the Midlands um, and East Coast, so hello. Um, everybody watching from Unison at King's College in London, hello to you. <laughs> um, Unite and GMB at Wincanton in Wigan. And close to my heart, the group from the Arts Union England in the Northeast region. Hello to everybody and welcome. And I want to give a special shout out to all of the freelance workers that are watching. Um, I heart unions because I know uh, I'm part of a collective voice and a collective vision being a member of a union. And as a freelance worker, it's hugely important. So now, Francis. Um, there's been a lot in the news this week uh, about Aslef's dispute with Southern Rail. Um, and I was wondering if you could explain to us the TUC's role in that. Thanks, Amy. First off, I'd just like to say a big hello and celebrate the work of all our brilliant members and reps in the rail industry who have been fighting this massive campaign, which is essentially about passenger and staff safety. Uh, now, uh, ASLEF have uh, done a deal which is subject to uh, the vote of their own membership, just as it should be, uh, with Southern Rail. Um, and that deal has been widely reported now, uh, but sometimes there's been a bit of misinformation in the press. That agreement that the executive of ASLEF uh, backed and is recommending provides for a second person on the train, something that both unions, RMT and ASLEF, have long fought for, uh, a real breakthrough. There are rare and exceptional circumstances where a train can run without a second person, but those have been subject to agreements in 2012 and 2009, and they're very specific and very rare. And secondly, that deal uh, provides for safety critical training for onboard supervisors, something they currently haven't got. So obviously we're a democratic movement and it's as left members who will vote on that deal and whether it goes through or doesn't go through is absolutely up to them. But uh, you know, it's been a, a tough process and tough talks, uh, but it's right that as left members decide. Well, equally topical, um, Theresa May promised to put workers on company boards. Uh, how do we hold her to that promise? Mm. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how easy that's going to be because you know there's, we there's been do -si doing on this one. But then, <coughs> you know, right back to Jack Jones's times, uh, that great Transport and General Workers Union leader, uh, the union movement has always believed that we should have a degree of industrial democracy in this country. And interestingly, all our polls show that right across the spectrum, people think it's common sense that workers should be on the boards. It's hugely popular, not least, I think, I suspect, because people are a bit fed up of what's been going on in terms of greed in respect of top pay, while everybody else uh, still is suffering, uh, still not getting the pay rises they deserve. So I think people um, want to see it. It's not just good for workers, though. What we know is that when there are workers on the boards, as there are in many other countries, it makes for better decision-making, too. Just like when people used to argue that we need more women on boards because we want to get rid of that groupthink, mm -hmm. it's really important to have workers there because they tend to argue strongly for long-term investment, R&D, training, education, jobs, and they put the perspective and expertise of the shop floor within that boardroom. So I hope that the uh, Prime Minister 
will think again. She's thought again quite a few times during this process, um, and maybe she can have another think uh, and do what is the right thing to do, an incredibly important thing to do when we're facing very uncertain times as we come out of the EU, important for our uh, people's livelihoods. And after all, who's got a bigger interest in the long-term success of a company than the people whose livelihoods depend on it. Absolutely. Well, um, our Prime Minister seems to have a lot on her plate at the moment uh, with Brexit. And now that we are leaving the EU, um, how important is it that we invest in jobs and training to remain competitive? Yeah. Well, the TUC has been very clear that working people must not pay the price of Brexit. And we want to see an industrial policy yeah. Uh, that guarantees that we get skilled jobs and good wages in the parts of Britain that need them most. And we also want a guarantee, not just to protect our existing rights, like holiday pay and maternity leave, um, but also rights going into the future. Now, I think the Prime Minister was wrong to set out the strategy that she did. And I think it's another case where she needs to rethink and start putting jobs and rights for working people first. Our economy is only successful if working people succeed. Mm. And, and what way can the unions help in this training? Uh, we uh, already do amazing work. Union Learn uh, provides learning opportunities to nearly a quarter of a million people every year. And we've demonstrated independent evidence that for uh, every pound that's invested, uh, businesses get nine pounds back through uh, better productivity and the country as a whole benefits. Uh, so our learning reps do an incredible job. And in particular, we want to make sure, can I just put in a plug, that every apprenticeship is a high quality, decently paid apprenticeship with that historic promise that you'll mm -hmm. get a decent job at the end of it yeah. upheld. Yeah. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to the Federation of Entertainment Unions, which includes um, Equity, the Writers Guild, the Musicians Union, um, and the NUJ, because I've done a lot of training with yeah. them. Um, certainly for freelance workers, it's hugely important to have access to this union training. Um, I've done their business skills for creative freelancers yeah. course, um, learned about finance, really important, um, and yeah. they've got a great digital learning program as well. So yeah. for anyone who's a member of those unions in particular, I'd say, you know, please do take advantage of, of, yeah. of what they've got going on. Um, now, we know that the world of work is changing in so many different ways. And TUC research that's been published this week shows that precarious work has gone up more than a quarter uh, mm. over the past five years. Um, what has driven that increase? And can you describe for us a bit what precarious work yeah. is? Well, I think a lot of people have heard mm -hmm. about uh, what's been going down at places like Sports Direct uh, in terms of zero hours contracts. And of course, at the likes of Uber with this sham self-employment, a very easy way of a bad employer shirking their responsibilities uh, to give people basic rights. Uh, but. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. And I should say it's not just minimum wage jobs either where we're seeing this problem. Uh, a lot of that growth um, in insecure work is being driven not just by hospitality and care, but areas like education too. And as you will know all too well, uh, the creative industries have more than their fair share of uh, precarious employment. So it's a massive problem mm -hmm. and one that we need to tackle. Yeah, I mean, freelancers, um, I think our experience is uh, job insecurity is, is kind of normal for yeah. us in a way. It's our natural habitat. And what a lot of freelancers don't know is that they can actually join a union. Yeah. Um, and there are unions out there for whatever sector that you work mm. in. Um, and it's really important because this gives us a collective voice. I mean, in the, in the end, that's the only way we are going to tackle casualization in whatever form it is, whether it's self-employment, temporary agency, zero hours contracts. You know, we're all in favor of flexibility as long as it's two-way flexibility yeah. and not just a way of stripping people of their rights. But we've got to get organized and that's a priority for us. Mm. Well, some of you who are watching today um, may not be aware that the government is holding an independent review mm -hmm. into shady employment practices. Um, what changes do you want to see, Francis? It's very simple for me. Uh, 
the top priority is we need stronger unions. And wouldn't it be great if we just had that simple right to go into workplaces and organise? Let's give people a genuine choice about getting organised and being able to uh, look after each other and get a fair deal at work. But we think that all working people should have the same basic rights. Everybody should have the right to guaranteed hours. Everybody uh, should have the right to basic rights like sick pay and holiday pay and maternity. And by the way, uh, just thinking about that Uber case, that the government has got to do something about those employment tribunal fees because how can anybody on low pay fork out over a £1,000 just to get a fair hearing? Mm. It's worth noting as well that um, people who are on contracts and members of unions are twice as likely to be on secure contracts. Yeah. So joining a union... Uh, Ultimately is the best way to tackle it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, I want to talk about young workers for a moment. Um, and this is something that's quite close to my heart as well. Um, I, I'm working alongside the Mayor of London, uh, as his knights are. Um, and... Great uh, job title. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Whoever arguing Whoever negotiated that. <laughs> that for you did a good job. Um, it even says it on my business cards, which is very <laughs> impressive. <laughs> anyway, um, a lot of young people work in the hospitality mm. industry, which, you know, I, I've met a lot of these young people in my uh, going out and about mm. um, as nights are. Um, how can we improve conditions for young people who are working in the hospitality industry? Yeah. Well, I, I think the first thing we need to recognise is, because there are a lot of myths about young people, that when young people are employed in areas where unions are strong, they're just as likely as anybody else uh, to join. The problem is, exactly as you say, they tend to be concentrated in what have traditionally been seen as hard to organise areas. But I think it's time that we as a trade union movement say that you know, no industry, no job can be a no-go zone for trade unions. And we need to recognise that if the current way that we organise ourselves as trade unions isn't working for young people, then maybe it's we're the ones who have to change. Mm. Um, we've got a lot of good work going on, currently preparing for a major campaign uh, involving all our unions in looking to target young people and encourage them into trade unions. And it might involve a lot of IT, it might involve new ways to campaign, new ways to organise, so be it, because we're a movement. Yeah. We've got to change with the times. I'm really glad to hear that, because less than 10% of young That's people right. are members of unions. Yeah. So um, I think there's a and lot they, of good work there you know, to be done. They need us more than ever. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, we've talked a lot about the advantages of being in a union, um, but besides marches and protests and organising and all the rest of it, how do we win real change in yeah. the workplace? Yeah. I mean, I think what's different about the trade union movement is we are inside the workplace. And in the end, what makes us different to any other organisation is that we're democratic, we're independent, and we're there to collectively bargain better deals for working people. We know that the only way we can even up that power is by banding together in unions and bargaining across the table and coming up with agreements. And we know that where we have got unionised workplaces, you're going to get better pay, you're going to work in safer conditions, you're more likely to get family-friendly hours, you know, a whole range of benefits that come through workers banding yes. together. So yes. the big message is to organise. Yes, absolutely. I wish I had a pound for every time someone was complaining about a really bad situation at work. And I say to them, are you a member of a union? And they say, no. And I just like, well, <laughs> it's, it's never too late. It's yeah. never, ever too late. And it's also important to note that members of trade unions tend to earn, on average, 10% more yeah. than their non-union colleagues. So, Absolutely. And, know, and in the end, this is all about reps. You know, yes. who We have amazing reps who uh, are incredibly skilled, experienced, and make a difference to people's lives every day of the yeah, week. Yeah. And, you know, there's no substitute for that. Yeah, yeah, great reps. Shout out for David in City Hall. <laughs> He's our rep there, and we love him. Well, thank you so much, Francis, for your time. Um, thank you for everybody uh, watching and sharing. Um, and now we've got to go out there and tell our friends and our family why we heart unions. Thanks, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.